Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford and welcome back. Today we're talking all about ovulation. I am answering some of your top questions including, does birth control impact my ovulation when I'm ready to get pregnant? Two, how do I know if I'm ovulating? And three, tell me all about the ways I can track my ovulation. We're talking calendar method, basal body temperature, ovulation predictor kits, and cervical mucus monitoring all in this episode to try to help you understand when you're ovulating so you know when you can target to try to get pregnant the best. Hi friends, welcome back. I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford and we are gonna talk all about ovulation. So in the menstrual cycle, we discussed how your different hormones are in play, which hormones cause ovulation. But if you're trying to get pregnant, ovulating is an essential point. And understanding how you can determine if you're ovulating can be really helpful in timing intercourse and having the highest chance of getting pregnant. Now, first of all, you don't have to track your cycles. You don't have to time. That's not right for everybody. Some people just want to start trying and see if it works for them. But if you're controlling, like me, or some of my friends, then perhaps you want to try to optimize your chance of getting pregnant every month. If you're like me also, and a professional woman who perhaps delayed childbearing a little bit while you chased other goals, you're going to want to make the most of your months once you get the chance. So that's where we're starting today. I will start by saying this. One of the top questions I get asked is, does birth control pills impact your fertility? And specifically, does it impact your ability to get pregnant when you stop the pill or any type of birth control for that matter? First of all, let's talk briefly about birth control pills. Birth control pills work by preventing the brain from sending out FSH. If FSH is the hormone that causes eggs to grow and your brain doesn't send any of it out, you're not going to ovulate. So the primary mechanism, how birth control pills, the combination estrogen progesterone pill, it prevents ovulation from occurring. Progesterone also thins out the endometrial lining. Periods are not gonna be heavy. They're gonna be lighter and they're gonna be easier. So usually you will get lighter, less pain with your periods in addition to not ovulating. But that's really key in how birth control pills work. One thing that I hate is people talking about post-birth control pill syndrome or talking about how the birth control pill now messed up your period. Listen to me, if you're taking your birth control pills every day, like the pack tells you, your periods are gonna be regular and that's normal and that's good, okay? When you stop the pill, you now are no longer giving your body estrogen and progesterone. So your body has to do it itself. That doesn't mean the pill caused a problem if your periods are now irregular. It can mean that maybe you had a problem that you were treating. You were treating your problem with birth control pills. Now that you don't have that estrogen and progesterone, it's up to your body to do the job, and maybe it can't for a variety of reasons, and it is worth getting an evaluation. If you are not on birth control pills and you do not have regular periods, regular predictable periods, every month the same for you, the odds are that you are not ovulating. In studies of birth control, what it showed is that sometimes women had a delayed month trying to get pregnant within the first six months. So the group of women who are not using birth control pills in the past year and who started trying to get pregnant, they would get pregnant on average in three or four months. And women who stopped using the pill, who had used the pill for the past year, then tried to get pregnant, they'd get pregnant in four to five months. So about a month different in that first six months, but by six months there was no difference and there was no increased chance of infertility. So birth control pills do not impact your fertility. They may take you about a month extra to start trying to get pregnant Likely this is due to prolonged progesterone impact on the lining, so thinning out the endometrial lining and just letting your brain kick in and start to ovulate, self-weeding out people who are not ovulating. That being said, you're not gonna see a prolonged detriment. Another question is, does birth control pills keep you having eggs since you're not ovulating them? The answer is no. Those eggs are still coming out of the vault. They are just not seeing any FSH, so nothing is ovulating. So all the eggs are dying that month instead of just all the ones but the one you ovulate. That's really just important to know. So now we can dive into, you're no longer using hormonal contraception. Now you're ready to ovulate, what's gonna happen? So number one, the number one sign that you are ovulating is regular predictable periods for you, for you. 
So if you have 28 day cycles, that means within one to two days of expected, literally I should be able to give you a calendar and you can look at it and tell me what day you think you're gonna ovulate. And you shouldn't be wrong by more than two days. And if you are, that's not normal. And the greatest odds is that you're at least not ovulating regularly. Abnormal ovulation can be for a variety of reasons. So it can be from the ovary not responding. So it can either not respond because you're in ovarian failure or because you have PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. It can be because the brain signals are getting messed up. That can be from pituitary disease or thyroid disease or from high levels of stress or extreme weight loss or exercise. So there's a variety of reasons why your body may not send out the right hormones. And they're all associated with different patterns. But if you are ovulating, how do you determine what day you're actually ovulating? What we know is the egg lives after it's been released for about 24 hours. So that's right. You have 24 hours to have sex if you're trying to get pregnant in that ovulatory window. So that's not very much time. Now, sperm, when you have intercourse, can live in the vagina and the cervix, so the female reproductive tract, for about up to five days, okay? Now, five days is the extent of it. We really think the vast majority of sperm go right through the fallopian tubes immediately, and then some can hang out for another day or so. So what you will hear is if you don't wanna track your cycles at all, but they are regular and predictable, that if you have sex every other day in your fertile window, you are covering your basis. That's because sperm can live for about 48 hours, as we said, and if you have sperm there, then the egg comes out. The egg is like perfume to the sperm. It attracts the sperm to it, so hopefully they can swim there and go fertilize the egg. Now, you may be fine with that. All right, my periods are regular. We're gonna have sex every other day. Let's knock it out of the park. That should be great. Common question, is sex every day or every other day better? And I always say this, Having too much sex is not bad as long as you're consistent with it. Meaning if you really have sex every day, you're exposing some sperm to that egg constantly and that's fine. If you are not sex every day people and you start having sex every day, that may make it difficult to now go and get pregnant. So you wanna be able to time your intercourse appropriately. Now, if you want to know when your fertile window is, one way is the calendar method. So if you take your average cycle length and you subtract it by 14, that's the average day that you ovulate. Your most fertile window, so when people talk about the fertile window, the fertile window is the five days ending on ovulation. And that's because of the length of time that sperm can live and the variability in your cycle. So if your cycle days are every 28 days, 28 minus 14, so 14 is the average length of the luteal cycle, what you're gonna see is that typically you're gonna ovulate around day 14. So that day that you ovulate is the last day of your fertile window so your fertile window would be days 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, okay? Those would be the key days to start having sex. So what I often tell patients is if your period is every 28 days, start having sex every other day around day 10, and you're gonna capture your fertile window if you do that for a week. Now, if you'd like to be a little more precise by that, we can do that. I'm gonna say this though about the calendar method. That's essentially what I just went over. Average cycle length minus 14 tells you your fertile window. If you are using an app and if you're watching me on YouTube, you are probably using an app to put your cycle data in. Hey, I love that, but know this. The app is a mathematical formula. What I just told you is what it is doing. Before the days of the apps, we charted on graph paper, people brought it in with their calendars and we did all of that. But this is just a formula. So your app is taking your average cycle length and it's modifying it month by month as it gets more data for you and telling you your fertile window. And listen really super closely. If your periods are not perfectly predictable within one to two days of expected, the formula is off. The formula is off. Studies have shown that women are tracking their cycles based on this calendar method put in their app and totally having sex in the wrong fertile window. Data out's only as good as the data in. So if the data you're giving the app is that your periods are all over the place, it's gonna give you a fertile window all over the place as well. So please pay attention so you can know. Now, other ways that you can detect ovulation. One is something called BBT, basal body temperature. So basal body temperature, it's not my favorite way. I usually tell patients by the time they get to me not to bother with it because I don't want you to be stressed out or anything like that at that stage of the game. Basal body temperature is when you're taking your temperature first thing in the morning with a very specific thermometer so it can detect these kind of micro incremental changes. Now, it's accurate, meaning after you ovulate, 
your body makes progesterone. We talked about that. The corpus luteum makes progesterone. Progesterone raises your body temperature. So detecting a shift or an increase in your temp. So if you're temping and you see a shift, now your temperature is higher, that confirms you ovulated. But it doesn't help you in past tense. So it doesn't help you say, oh, well now I've already ovulated and if you didn't have sex, it did not help you. However, if you chart and you temp and your periods are perfectly regular every day, it can help fine tune and predict for the next cycle. So if your cycles are perfect at 28 days and you always get a temp shift at day 15, then you know ovulation for you is around day 14. So it can be help for future cycles if your periods are predictable. Please, if your periods are not predictable, do not waste your time temping. Don't spend your precious mental energy doing temping. Okay, you got me? Not worth it. There's also ways like Ava bracelet and things like that, and that's what they do as well. They are just checking your temperature constantly. So it's a little less cumbersome, but the data you get out is only as good as what you put in. So if your periods aren't regular, temping is not for you. Now, LH testing is ovulation predictor kits. Remember that LH is the search from the brain that tells the body it's time to ovulate. OPK is kind of the commonplace term for what we use for ovulation predictor kit. It is a urinary kit that you pee on a stick and you get a surge, so you're measuring LH. There are digital options, and there's also options that are not, they're just a flat line, and both of them are fine. If you're using the line version, you need the test strip line to be darker than the control. If you're using the digital version, it'll just tell you yes or no that you ovulated. I like the digital because I think your time is precious, and I don't want you staring at strips trying to say, is the line darker or lighter? But it's up to you. Certainly digital can be more expensive, you can buy the cheapos on Amazon, so that may suit you better. But there are some downfalls. So you have to check it every day. So you have to check it every day because your surge may only last for 24 hours. Also, the surge is released in the early morning. So if you're a doctor like me and you're up really early and then you're at work, checking your first morning urine may not work for you. And that's because just because your brain is surging doesn't mean it's in your pee yet. So what I usually say is, hey, if that's what it takes for you, then you need to check your ovulation test between 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. every day. And that's what I tell my patients. Between 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., one time per day, that's the optimal time to check your OPK. And when you get a positive, that's LH surging from the brain, it's going to tell your ovary to ovulate the next day. So the key, if you guys are in a fight and you're only gonna have intercourse two times trying to get pregnant, it's gonna be the day of the positive OPK and the day after, because the day after the positive is the day that you are going to be ovulating. And so that day of the positive is going to give you a little bit of a sperm boost, ready and waiting for the egg for whatever time it's released at. Do not check OPKs after you've gotten your first surge. I'm saying this again for you, Megan. Do not check OPKs the day after you get your first positive. They are worthless. The corpus luteum, which is what that follicle was that makes progesterone, is making progesterone in pulsatile fashion due to pulsing of LH through the whole luteal phase. So you're gonna waste your money and your time by checking LHs. Once you get your first positive, you get your big surge, and then you're gonna see pulses. So the first positive is then gonna tell you when you're ovulating, the rest of them are not worth it. So do not use them, okay? So we've gone over calendar method, temping, OPKs, and then there's also cervical mucus. Cervical mucus monitoring is an easy way to try to do this. It is definitely the most inexpensive. So what you're doing for cervical mucus monitoring is you're taking your two fingers, putting them up in your vagina, pulling out cervical mucus, and stretching it so you can see what it looks like. Trust me, it sounds weird. When you do it, you'll know what's normal and what's not. What you are looking for is your type four cervical mucus that's gonna be stretchy, egg white. So think about egg white consistency. That is ovulation day. So if you check it every day, the day you get that stretchy egg white, that's from estrogen levels being high enough that you're ovulating, and that is your peak day to have sex if you're doing cervical mucus monitoring. Targeting in your key day of ovulation can help you try to optimize your chances of getting pregnant per month. If you're not ovulating, here's my plea. Please don't waste your own time. Don't listen to when anybody tells you you need to wait six months or a year before you go see a fertility doctor or your OBGYN. If your periods are not regular and predictable, something is wrong and you deserve an evaluation to figure that out before you're already behind the game. So please be your own advocate.
as always, thank you guys so much for watching. I just love that you guys are following along and subscribing and sharing this. Ah, it means so much to me. You can always get more information on the podcast as a woman. You can follow me on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. Thank you so much. Thank you.